Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for our message this morning is our gospel lesson from Matthew 25, where we hear again these words. First to the two faithful servants who double their talents, the master says the same thing to both. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. But to the unfaithful servant who buried the talent, he said, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into our earth. This is the word of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, many of us have money set aside in different accounts. There's money that's set aside in the savings or the checking accounts at the bank. There's money that we have sitting around at home in our sock drawer or something like that in the form of cash or gift cards. And then there's money that we have invested with different financial companies to help you manage your money. And the goal is simple. Help your money to grow. With that company, you'll likely have a financial advisor. And especially since you are paying them fees, annual fees for their services, fees for the purchase of assets, whenever that happens for your account, these advisors are held to what's known as the fiduciary standard. In other words, they are legally obligated to do what's best for you and for your money given your life's situation. And if they don't, there will be problems on multiple levels, either legally and then also with you because you'll probably move your money somewhere else. Well, we see this a little bit in our gospel lesson today, don't we? A man gives his money to three different servants, each according to his own ability. And of course, naturally, the two talents, or the two that he gives more to, they both succeed greatly. Man, I wish that the people who we put the most money into uh, for our investments in regular day life would always succeed uh, greatly. Uh, so they both double the talents uh, that are given. And remember, again, we're not talking about talents like natural ability, how we use that word today. We're not talking about the talent of being athletic or the talent of, of being good at crafts or something like that. No, a talent here is a unit of money. And remember from a couple months ago, we had the parable of the unforgiving servant, and we talked about how much a talent was worth. How a talent was worth roughly 20 years' wages. So, in other words, the man, as he's entrusting this money to these servants, uh, this is no chump change. Uh, for the, that first servant who's holding uh, uh, five talents, he's essentially holding a hundred years worth of wages of regular workers in his hands. The second is holding about 40, and the third is holding about 20, even. Even though he was only given one talent, it was still a lot of money. And so the point is clear that all three of these servants had a significant amount of money that was entrusted to them. So how would you react in this situation if you were one of these servants? How would you react if you were given that much money and you were expected to make it grow and not shrink? Would you be like, well, this is great. I know exactly how to make it grow. I think a lot of us would probably be terrified. But that's not what we see in the first two servants, is it? They go to work and they get it done. They double the talents uh, that they were given. They obviously were capable managers and they took steps to grow their master's talents because they knew that if they did so, that meant success not only for the master, but also for them as well. But then we have that other servant. He doesn't take steps to put the money to work in order for it to grow, but rather just finds a safe place and buries it. What do you think was going on through his mind at that time? Yes, Matthew later records him saying, Master, you are, I know you're a hard man, reaping where you don't sow, and gathering where you have scattered no seed. So I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. 
But folks, this is just the, the thing with reading texts. It's sometimes hard to kind of decipher what the motive is, right? It's hard to understand what the emotion is, isn't it? Haven't you ever uh, found yourself before reading a text message and you're not exactly sure if the response was, was happy or sad or sarcastic or indifferent or something like that? Well, it's the same thing here. It's hard to always know what exactly the motive uh, or the tone is that's being said. And so this servant really could have had several emotions that may be easy for us to pass over. He could have been frustrated that the other two servants received more talents and more responsibility when he felt he should have gotten more. He may have been legitimately afraid of screwing up what his master had given for him to do, and that's why he buried it. Or consider this part of his reply to his master. Could you convey that in a little bit, it, it kind of sounds a little bit accusatory, after all, he calls his master hard, and that he's essentially exploiting the work of the laborers in order to make a profit. And so maybe it's out of spite that he returns uh, this talent back to his master without making any effort to carry out the responsibilities given to him. And in doing this, he shows he really doesn't love his master at all, does he? Because he blames him and excuses himself. And so again, we know what happens in the parable. The two who are faithful are good, and they receive the reward, and the third is unfaithful and is punished. So dear friends, as we talked about this last week, we want to be growing uh, in God's word. We want to be like the wise virgins and not the foolish. So what does Jesus have to say to us today in this parable? First, I think it's important for us to remember who this parable uh, is for. Maybe it's not for us at all. Maybe is it just a parable about condemning the Jews for their unbelief? Oh yes, yes, that's too bad that they didn't believe and kept disobeying God's commands. Or is this parable just about condemning modern day pastors and church leaders who don't get it done? Yep, yeah, 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 that must be it. Pastor Craig just can't seem to get church attendance up. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that must be it. Oh, sorry friends, this parable, once again, is for all of us as Christians. It's for all of us, and I think that's highlighted in the fact of what the Master does in this parable. Did you notice he entrusts the, the talents to each of the servants, and then he goes away for a long time? That's exactly what Jesus did with his disciples. How he came and he taught them and he lived and he died and he rose uh, for our forgiveness and life. He ascends into heaven and leaves. But that doesn't mean the work of God stops. No, it keeps going. The disciples share the good news. And that's how it keeps happening with us to this day. Because Jesus Christ has poured out his spirit on you, given to you in your baptism, as we've heard that word proclaimed and as we've received the Lord's Supper again. In all of that, we'll continue to be strengthened to then go out and share that hope of eternal life with others. So this parable is for all of us. Jesus has poured out his spirit upon us. So we're, one, transformed in Christ to share the hope of eternal life. And two, so we participate in actually sharing that hope of eternal life with others. And yet we see that God gives each of us widely and various gifts. Doesn't he? After all, these gifts and abilities uh, that he gives us. Uh, I think about this, you know, I can wash a car, uh, but I can't build a car from scratch like Randy can. You know, I can check my temperature, but I can't draw blood, and I don't know how to do uh, various different medical procedure, procedures like, like, uh, like Beverly or uh, Vicki can. And so all of us have also different amounts of financial resources given to us. Some have more, some have less. And in our American culture, as we think about both of these, it can be very tempting uh, to just be uh, bitter and to covet other people, can it? Whether it's talents and abilities or better finances and material possessions, we can be just like that last servant, begrudgingly looking at what God has given to others and in our jealousy, neglecting to use the very things that he has given to us. And so it's in moments uh, like these, dear friends, uh, that I have to admit I think of my father-in-law. 
Now, he's got on my case recently a little bit about whenever you mention the father-in-law, you're always, you know, you seem to be bringing up some sort of negative example. So <laughs> I'm going to bring up a positive example here about my father-in-law. This is going to be recorded so he can see someday, look, father-in-law, this is a good example of what you taught your, uh, my wife and her sisters. And so this example is he would always say to Krista and her sisters, control what you can control. So we can't always control uh, what we have uh, in our life, uh, but we can control the things that God has entrusted to us. And remember what the master says to the two faithful servants, well done, good and faithful servant. God is looking for faithfulness in what he has given to us. Whether that's big or small, whether that's a lot or a little, he's just looking for faithfulness in how we manage our money and how we use it to be a blessing to other people. He's looking for faithfulness in how we use our gifts and abilities and how we develop those to be a blessing to other people. And both in our community and in our workplace, in our families, among our friendships, in all these places. Because after all, the Lord has been so incredibly gracious to us. Our Lord Jesus died and rose so that we can have that forgiveness in life each and every day. But God's grace does not condone irresponsibility with the gifts and responsibilities that he's entrusted to our care. After all, what did Paul say? Are we to continue to sin so that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were therefore baptized into his death? We were buried with him in baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. As I mentioned earlier, investment advisors are legally obligated to work on behalf of your best interests. They have to do it. That being said, some do that better than others. Now all of us know that it's one thing to have to do something to be obligated to do something, and it's another thing entirely to want to do something. Dear friends, Jesus wanted to come to this earth on your behalf. He wanted to come to live, to die, and rise for your forgiveness and life so that you can walk uh, in the newness of life each and every day as God's children. And so this day I want to encourage you and remind you to know that you are God's forgiven and redeemed children. But I also want to encourage you to consider the task that God has given to you. And know also that he wants you to be prepared for the good works that he has given you to do. Again, not to save yourself, but to be a blessing to other people. And so I want to challenge you to ask, how am I being faithful with what God has given to me? How am I using the money and the talents and the abilities that God has given me to be a blessing to other people? and to serve him in his kingdom. And as you think about yourself and your own unique situation, remember the Lord's Prayer and focus on those two petitions, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Because after all, Martin Luther said that we don't want to just pray that God's kingdom is done just generally, but also that it is done among us also. May God grant that for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds in this Christ Jesus to life eternal. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. How are you guys doing? I have something here. What is this? A Reese's. Now, I learned something interesting about Reese's the other day. Did you know that Reese's, that the orange color is trademarked? Isn't that interesting? The orange color is trademarked. So whenever you see this orange color, you're supposed to think, I need to eat a Reese's. Isn't that crazy? It makes me want to eat a Reese's all the time. Uh, and I have a few of them sitting on my desk, but I don't really want to eat them. Uh, so, because I know it's not good for me. So it's a constant struggle, Wyatt and Billy and everybody up here. But, this is what I know. Is that we similarly have a trademark color as well. God has made us white the blood of the Lamb. He's made us white. We have that. That is our new identity. That's our trademark that we've been washed uh, clean from our sins. Uh, and that's great that we get to rejoice and live in that each and every day. 
Uh, so whenever you see a Reese's and know uh, that the orange is trademarked for them, know that your trademark uh, is white.